Part 1. 5 to 1. Friday, December 31st, 2020. Chapter 1. The Calm Before Blue Beam. The space's otherworldly feel hit Marcus like he'd run into an actual force field. Despite the late afternoon hour, his living room was completely dark from the cardboard taped all over the first floor windows to keep prying eyes from seeing the debauchery they had planned for the night. Black lights illuminated a neon galaxy of plastic stars and planets taped to the furniture, walls, and ceiling, while REM's It's the End of the World as We Know It blasted from the partially assembled sound system. The skunky smell of cannabis clung to everything. Jordan stood entranced in the corner, silhouetted by the light of a star field scrolling across a wall of LED panels. His pot belly protruded over his belt as he clenched a limp quarter-inch TRS cable in one hand and stroked his curly brown beard with the other. Are you almost done? Marcus shouted over the music. Jordan's focus didn't waver from the tablet sitting between his turntables. Marcus formed a megaphone with his hands. Earth to Jordan! Jordan paused his facial fondling to wave him over to his side. Marcus shuffled through the darkness, tripping over one of the speakers still sitting next to its stand on the floor. The song was even more deafening near the DJ station. Can we turn this off? Jordan pulled down a fader on the mixer without breaking his focus from the quick-cut videos playing on his iPad. Thanks, Marcus said, dusting himself off. I hate that song. Since when? Ever since we saw Contact. Jordan finally shifted his attention away from the screen, peering out the corner of his eyes. What the shit are you talking about? That movie with Jodie Foster? That's the Mandela effect, Jordan dismissed. Marcus scrunched his brow. I'm not falling for that trick again, where you swap the name of a movie or an actor to confuse me. I know she was in contact. The story Carl Sagan wrote, where aliens send a radio signal to Earth so we can build a transport. It was a novel first, but that's not what I'm talking about. The Mandela effect is when you remember something differently than how it really went down. That R.E.M. song isn't in contact, dude. You're mixing it up with Independence Day or Tommy Boy. Marcus searched his mind. But before he could reconcile the memories with Jordan's claim, his friend dropped the audio cable and snatched his tablet off the Mackie mixer. Look at this. Marcus stared intently at the screen. He couldn't suss out the context from the video. Can you turn on the sound? Jordan raised a different fader, sending the newscaster's voice echoing through their living room. She spoke with a South African accent and highlighted the surge in crop circles around the Southern Hemisphere over the last 24 hours. Talk about a fitting end for 2020. Jordan swiped to another tab displaying the Coast to Coast AM homepage. These crop circles aren't the only paranormal activity happening right now. The Schumann resonances are going bonkers. Marcus inspected the charts supporting his roommate's claim. Jordan fished a striped glass pipe from his pocket and inhaled, struggling to speak while holding in a heroic hit. My friends, at the Good Judgment Open, have predicted an alien invasion for years. But the odds skyrocketed yesterday. Okay. Jordan continued in his hypercadence. The Global Consciousness Project's field regs went haywire yesterday, too. They haven't spiked like that since the 9-11 attacks. Except this was a hundred times larger. Something major is about to go down. Something earth-shattering. How much pre-gaming have you done? Jordan blew smoke into his friend's face. Not enough. Marcus waited for the cloud to dissipate, which allowed Jordan to push ahead with his conspiracy theory. There have been 808 UFO sightings in the last day. Marcus rolled his eyes. That's a suspiciously specific number. The math doesn't lie. A huge number of them happen around nuclear weapons sites. Remember the Malmstrom Air Force Base event? When a UFO disabled all their missiles? No, when was that? March 24th, 1967. Marcus cackled. Tonight's party wasn't just about ringing in the new year. It marked Jordan's 18th birthday, exactly one day before Marcus's. I can't believe I missed that. You're supposed to be the history buff between us, Jordan quipped. It's in your blood. Drop the lube and pull up your pants, Anthony proclaimed from the kitchen. Help me bring in the booze. Like Marcus, his brother Anthony shared the same olive skin, dark hair, and chestnut eyes inherited from their Italian mother. But unlike Marcus, Anthony was a half foot shorter and would turn 37 in two weeks. 
Over the last few years, the trio made a tradition of consolidating their birth's proximity into a single, epic celebration. But this was the first time they'd hosted the event at Marcus and Jordan's house blocks from the University of Utah's campus. All previous parties had taken place at Marcus's family's home in the mountains of Sundance. The trunk of Antony's Tesla was brimming with cardboard boxes packed with bottles. It took multiple trips to move everything to the house, but Jordan passed the time by briefing Antony on the state of alien affairs in the world. My favorite Reddit forum is now reporting snow circles. What are those? Antony shouted at Jordan in his best meme voice, fist bumping his own chest. R.I.P. Young Busco. Jordan didn't blink. They're intricate geometric shapes like crop circles, but in the snow fields of the Arctic and Antarctic. Someone from Reddit made the journey to both poles to see them firsthand, Marcus mocked, organizing the liquor bottles by type across their expansive white tile kitchen countertop. Satellites, bro! Zoom.Earth showed the shapes in real time. An alien invasion would be an apropos ending to this year, Antony chuckled, cracking a bottle of scotch and offering a toast. Is there an echo in here? That's what I said before you arrived. Jordan mirrored his movements as the pair clanked bottles and chugged the brown liquid. Did you get the dry ice? Antony asked Marcus. Yeah, it's on the back porch next to the cooler. I already broke it into smaller pieces, like your twenty text messages insisted. Antony hopped in place. Where's the infused fruit? Behind you? Marcus motioned toward the fridge. It's been soaking since last night in beehive vodka. Jordan rubbed his hands together. You're making solutions? You know it, Antony smiled. Help me carry in the cooler. Marcus used the momentary lull to center himself, retrieving his memento mori coin from his front pocket, closing his eyes and inhaling slowly. He had a terrible feeling about tonight. He hadn't completed his daily affirmation yet, but this was something else. As soon as he got a moment alone, he thought, he'd find a mirror and complete the stoic-inspired ritual to ensure a smooth evening. The jovial banter of his companion's return forced Marcus back to the present. With flawless choreography, Jordan set the ute-branded cooler on the countertop as Antony donned Kevlar gloves and combined golf-ball-sized chunks of dry ice with bottles of liquor into the container. Like a well-seasoned sous-chef, Jordan fetched the infused fruit and added it along with cans of juice concentrate to Antony's concoction, now bubbling like a witch's cauldron. Jordan hovered over the thickening substance and inhaled before spinning in place, blowing billows of smoke from his nose at the Adams brothers. Be careful there, Merlin, Marcus mocked. Jordan held his right arm to the sky. Everyone who made it to midnight during last year's celebration, please raise your hand. Antony matched Jordan's motion. Marcus rocked back onto his heels. I blacked out because I was trying to keep up with the two of you. Amateurs should know better than to step into the ring with seasoned pros. Jordan chastised. Stick to White Claws tonight. Slushy is his kryptonite, Antony added. Dude, we should take muscle relaxers and push each other down the stairs again this year, Jordan said to Antony. Marcus couldn't mask his uneasiness. Antony stopped stirring. I was joking about the kryptonite. It's not that. Is it the muscle relaxer idea? Jordan inquired. No. Then what's with the Eeyore face? Antony asked. I have a bad feeling about tonight. Marcus declared. It's the impending alien invasion, Jordan insisted. I felt it all day. It's Project Blue Beam and... Antony held his palm up to Jordan. You're not helping. Maybe he's right. What are you feeling? Antony probed. Describe it. This dull ache in the pit of my stomach like I'm forgetting to do something. My head is throbbing and my ears are ringing, but that could be from Jordan blasting his music for the last hour. Are you worried about the cops shutting us down? I'll run interference. If you're old enough to be drafted and sent to die on a battlefield in North Korea, you should be able to drink and rent a car when we're on our grand tour summer after next. Speaking of which, Jordan squeezed all ten fingers into the pockets of his skin-tight jeans. I've got a gift for you. We agreed, no presents this year. I know, sue me. Jordan handed over a new Utah driver's license bearing Marcus's smiling face. I already have one of these. Not like that, Jordan replied. Look closer. Marcus inspected the card. I don't think they'll believe I'm 26. Or that my middle name is Bitchface. That's not a fake ID. I mean, it is, but not like you're thinking. It took half the summer and the help of a hacker I met online to update your record in the state's database. 
That card came from the DMV. They mailed it to us a month ago. Unless someone has your birth certificate or passport, that driver's license proves you're Marcus Bitchface Adams. The third. Thanks. He held up the card to his face for them to see. Besides buying booze or renting a car, Antony added, that could get you out of a jam tonight in case the cops bust us. I'm not worried about the police. Is your anxiety over who's coming? Maybe, Marcus replied. That feels like it might be closer. Antony half smiled. Who's on the guest list? Jordan handled invites. The only person I told was Diana. I'd be anxious about seeing her too. Antony belly laughed. Jordan and Marcus scowled at their sage elder. Don't do that tonight, okay? Marcus chastised. She's not the reason I feel this way. And your hostility will inflame things between us. Roger, roger. Antony saluted his brother and returned to stirring. Could it be the catharsis of ending one of the hardest years on record? Not just for you individually, but for any human that's ever lived? Between the election, the riots, the virus, earthquakes, murder hornets, and Tiger King? Free Joe Exotic! Free Joe Exotic! Jordan chanted. There's a killer joke in there about Diana and Carol Baskin. Antony motioned like he was slitting his own throat. Kidding aside, this is one hell of a time to be coming of age. When I turned 18, my biggest concern was picking the Sega CD game to play on my old system. I can't imagine what it's like for the two of you walking into a world falling apart at the seams. That wasn't your most uplifting speech, Marcus replied. For real, Jordan nodded while puffing on his pipe. Who said the truth has to be uplifting? The data is clear, 2020 was a shit show. An alien invasion, assuming Jordan's theory can be believed, would be the perfect coda to an unparalleled year. It's not a theory! Jordan lifted his chin an inch higher. Marcus turned to face his friend. How's that? The Pentagon said UFOs are real, Jordan replied. Marcus rolled his eyes again. They admitted to possessing off-world vehicles, Jordan said. That's true, Antony added. They did disclose that. An alien invasion isn't a question of if anymore. Jordan paused to take another hit of cannabis. It's a matter of when. I don't remember hearing any of this, Marcus scoffed. The media was shockingly silent, Antony added. I only remember a few stories coming out around Pioneer Day. Yep, Jordan affirmed. The three of them sat in silence. Use your access to the university's database to look it up when classes start in a few weeks, Antony encouraged. Until then, let's toast and set our intentions for the year before everyone arrives. Can we use the slushy? Jordan peered into the cooler. Antony pushed him away. It needs a couple hours. Marcus handed his brother a bottle of grappa. Their parents drank the transparent Italian liquor every Sunday evening before their untimely deaths. Jordan placed three red solo cups on the counter, and Antony made a four-finger pour for each of them. Marcus's brother was the first to offer his intention. To a return to normalcy. A life of freedom and individual choices. The three drank, then Antony poured more before Jordan offered up his intention. To full disclosure, the truth is out there and I have a feeling we'll know sooner than expected. The oily liquor burned as it slid down Marcus's throat. He had to coax his stomach to be still as Antony poured the final round. All eyes turned to the youngest man among them, but Marcus hesitated. He wasn't sure what he wanted for the year. He was consumed by anxiety over the present and immediate future. As his legal guardian, Antony had pushed Marcus into attending university. But after one semester, this didn't feel like the life he was meant to live. Jordan tapped his foot. The year's about to pass us by! An idea struck Marcus like lightning. To destiny. As her silver cigar-shaped transport departed, Velia huddled among the sparse brush beneath the emblematic U painted onto the mountainside above campus. She was alone. No one would notice the craft, thanks to its silent engines and cloaking technology. The last time she'd felt earth beneath her feet, she'd been a child. But an extended lifetime had prepared her for this moment. Memories of her final test raced through her mind. She recalled the strategy that had worked all those years ago, lurking among the uninitiated as she stalked her prey. A true hunter. Like the mythical video game Polybius that had put her on this path, Velia knew her mission was more of a marathon than a sprint. Since then, her hair had grown back, allowing her to fit in with this new world as she scouted her target and infiltrated his inner circle. 
At that point, Velia thought, she'd plot how to capture, contain, or if no other option was available, kill him. She studied the ring on her middle finger while scanning the surrounding environment with her right hand until its red phase indicated the direction she should travel. With her final destination locked in, Velia strolled down the trail under the cover of twilight. She had a party to attend.